Hi guys, it's your science teacher here, back with another video. This time I'm going to go through the whole of the topic B16, which is adaptation, interdependence and competition with you guys. So without further ado, let's get started and let's get into today's video. We start off this topic by looking how different plants and animals interact with one another. This is because of the fact that organisms are not often seen on their own. They are often interacting with a variety of different organisms on a large scale. And what they live in is called a community. Now, a lot of the different species in a community are interdependent on one another. And this basically means that they rely on one another in order to survive. For example, all communities must have some sort of plant species. These animals then can use these plants in order for shelter, food, and in order to make themselves a little bit of a home. Some communities can be defined as stable communities and this is where the population of different species uh, remains quite constant. And an example of a stable community could be the Great Barrier Reef. Now the Great Barrier Reef supports uh, a wide variety of different plants and organisms. However, if there are some small changes, for example, if the temperature uh, of the water becomes too hot, then this can cause the coral to die. Now, the coral is what is known as a keystone species. And this means uh, that if it does get taken out of the community, uh, then this can cause many other different um plants or animals around it to sadly not be able to survive. Also, it's important to remember that each plant or animal has a role in the ecosystem that they are living in. And the role that they have is the niche they occupy. For example, if we look at a lion over here, a lion is what we know as a predator and it lives on the ground. Now, there can't be too many different species occupying the same niche. This is why uh, you will find that the lion doesn't share its environment with too many other top, top predators. And depending on the ecosystem you are looking at, there could be lots of different habitats and lots of different niches. For example, if you take this picture, for example, here you can see there's loads of different habitats for all these different animals. For example, there's water down here where the hippos are swimming in. That's uh, a habitat and a different niche to be occupied. Whereas here you can see up here there's some uh, flamingos flying in the sky and there's some trees for them to perch on. And there's also some parrots you can see there flying between uh, the different trees as well. Now, we can estimate the population of different species in this particular habitat or particular ecosystem using what we call quadrats. And how these quadrats work is we can count the number of different species that are present inside of that quadrat. And we can create what is called a frequency table of all the different species present. Now, if we know the size of the area we are investigating and we know the size of our quadrat, we can multiply out and estimate the population in a whole field or a whole habitat. But there are some key considerations that we need to make when using these quadrats. For example, we need to make sure that we place the quadrats randomly. Because if we don't, we are putting bias into our experiment. 
And the way you can place your quadrat randomly uh, is you can use random number generators or you can use dice, um, which can indicate where that you place that quadrat on that field. Or it might not be a field that you're investigating. Uh, it could be a swampland. I don't know, but <laughs> it's very important that we place our quadrat randomly. As well as placing our quadrat randomly, it's important to take repeats because of the fact you are likely to get a wide variety of different um, species in a field and it's important that you should take repeats in order to make sure our results are reliable. And the last thing uh, that they might ask you about when quadrating is you also need to be consistent with how you select your species. So what I mean by that is um, if it's touching the outside of your quadrat, if you include it in one reading, you include it in all of your readings. Now, you can use quadrats placing them randomly in a field or there is another way to place your quadrats randomly and that is using uh, what you call a transect line and you can use a transect line by walking in a straight line and placing your quadrat every 10 or so meters and therefore you'll get a fair reflection of the ecosystem that you are investigating. It's also important to remember that with quadrats, you don't have to be doing them for plants. You can also do them for animals as well. Now, there are a bunch of different biotic and abiotic factors that can affect the stability of an ecosystem. Now, a biotic factor is anything that is living. So anything that's living that can affect the stability of a community is known as a biotic factor. For example, uh, we could have bacteria, fungi, plants, archaea, animals and protists. Let's take, for example, let's look at an animal, for example. Now, if a new predator is introduced to a certain uh, habitat, that could have drastic impacts on that community. Um, an example would be the Burmese python in the Everglades. Now, since the Burmese pythons have been introduced into the Everglades, they've had a real negative impact on the, um, the native species in the area. They've actually outcompeted alligators in many areas and are devastating um, the number of bird species and rodent species around the Everglades National Park and that's situated in Florida. Not all biotic factors that can affect communities are human caused. For example, there could just be naturally occurring uh, bacteria um, that could have very negative impacts on other species or maybe in fact just something out competes another species and this can cause almost the survival of the fittest and affect communities in which different animals become outcompeted. Looking at abiotic factors, these are anything that is non-living that can affect a community. And that could be the salinity of the water, that means how much salt is present. The soil, usually the pH of the soil is what's important. The temperature of the environment, the amount of light that a plant might receive, the amount of water, minerals, pH and humidity. Now, humans are having a massive impact on a lot of these different factors. For example, we are changing the air quality and this can have massive negative impacts on different animals. We are also changing the soil pH due to acid rain and this negatively affects many plant species and if there's no plants then uh, maybe animals don't have habitats as well also temperature just think about if you are an arctic animal and the temperature is changing so rapidly and you're seeing your habitat uh, evaporating around you at such an alarming rate temperature humans um, are causing um, 
the climate to change in many different ways. We are causing a lot of more natural disasters, uh, long droughts, or even, in fact, uh, storms and tornadoes due to the fact we're putting in so much carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. Now, animals are always competing in the environment that they live in. And some of the key things they are competing for might be a mate. If you look down here, there's two uh, different antelopes and they are competing. They're probably male antelopes uh, for a mate in order to pass on their genes and reproduce. They also will compete for food in their environment you'll notice that some animals have really large territories for example snow leopards can have territories uh, over 50 kilometers squared uh, because of the fact there's not enough food in the, that um, environment so they have to have really large territories in order to almost um, ration out how much food there is uh, as well as this they also compete for habitats and space uh, if you are um, imagine if you're a crab you want the best shell to live in don't you you want the best shell that fits you uh, perfectly so they compete for that habitat now it is incredibly important that uh, animals do out compete their rivals because ultimately their goal is to reproduce and pass on their genes and if they don't have these three main factors, they will not be able to do so. Now, some animals um, gain adaptations in order to outcompete their rivals for certain uh, aspects that they're competing for. For example, uh, if you look at a peacock, uh, they are adapted by having incredibly large, beautiful tail feathers that they will use in order to outcompete other male uh, peacocks um, to find a mate. And what we're going to look at now is we're going to look at uh, a couple of animal adaptations um, where the animal is adapted to live in extreme environments. And these are called extremophiles. And here I've picked two different uh, species of fox. Now, although these two um, different species come from the same family, uh, you'll remember if you look at the organization topic, um, they are from the same family. They have very different adaptations due to the environment in which they are from. Over here, we have the Arctic fox, which is adapted to live in extreme uh, cold conditions. It has thick fur. It has white fur as well so that it can um, blend in with surroundings so that it doesn't get eaten and also so that it can sneak up the prey in which it hunts. In addition to this, uh, animals that are uh, found in the Arctic tend to have a large surface area. Now the large surface area means that it loses less heat. Another adaptation for it to lose less heat is the fact that it has small ears. Now, by having small ears, you're going to lose less heat. Your ears is one of the places where you lose the most heat through. And of course, it has all of the generic adaptations of a fox. It will have incredibly good smell so that it can smell out its prey that might be living beneath the ice and it will have sharp claws so that it can hunt and also then big sharp teeth. Now over here the desert fox uh, which is found in hot climates, extreme hot climates with not much water has very different adaptations. It has thin fur so that it doesn't overheat it has large ears and a small surface area so that it will lose more heat. And it can also use them large uh, ears in order to hear out for its prey that it might be hunting as well. And also it has that sandy color 
in order to make sure that it blends into its environment. So this means that it can uh, sneak up on its prey and also mean that it won't get hunted by other predators. Now, animals aren't the only organisms in their environment that are competing. Plants will also compete as well. They will compete for resources such as light, which is obviously a key component for photosynthesis to happen. The chlorophyll needs to absorb that sunlight in order to catalyze the reaction. Now, as well as this, they are competing for space. There is only a certain amount of space, especially in, uh, a, a, in an ecosystem such as the rainforest, space is valuable. And they will also um, need to reproduce. They can also compete for minerals in the soil. Now, plants can have some ingenious adaptations uh, for some of these uh, key resources that they need. For example, light, look at these vines, they can grow up trees in order to get sunlight very quickly. Um, they don't actually take much time growing because of the fact they do not have big tree trunks like the trees they bind to. In terms of space as well, uh, if you look here, um, you can see there's helicopter seeds being uh, this helicopter seeds being released from this tree, and this means that uh, they will travel far away, and therefore that the host tree will not have to compete with um, its offspring for space and compete for the different minerals and water in the soil. In terms of reproduction, uh, a lot of flowers are different coloured. Uh, this will mean that it will attract pollinators um, in order to uh, be fertilised. And in terms of competing for minerals, often plants have long roots in order to make sure that they can get to the minerals that are below the surface. Just like with animals, plants can come up with ingenious ideas um, in order to adapt and survive in their environment. For example, down here we have a carnivorous plant. Now, carnivorous plants often live in areas which are minerally poor, uh, meaning there is not enough nutrients in the soil in order to sustain their growth. So they actually get their minerals from consuming animals or consuming, consuming animal feces. Uh, for example, the toilet plant, uh, they actually contain laxatives, which the animals eat, and they will feed off the feces, which sounds gross, uh, but that's how they survive. Also, there are plants which will uh, lose their leaves in autumn and these happen in temperate climates where photosynthesis uh, is not likely to happen over winter and um, because it's too cold that the, therefore the reaction doesn't take place at a quick enough rate and there's not enough sunlight in order uh, for it to be beneficial to the plants they'll actually lose leaves in the autumn and be um be leafless over winter now, I hope you've enjoyed watching today's video. Please remember, if you did, to drop it a like and subscribe to the channel.